link. Apologies, everyone. Technical glitches, hey? These things happen. Uh, let's see if I can fix up one thing here. Technology is always a bit of fun. I'll just put a message, visit. Okay, I've just left a message there. If anyone's on the OET Center um, channel trying to get on, let's see if that helps them. Okay. All right, everyone, we ready to go. We have a thing we say at OET Online when we, we just type in ready to go. Uh, we have an acronym for that. It's R2G. Just type in R2G if you're ready to go. Um, and um, hello to Johnson over there in Malaysia. Okay, let's get it started. Um, let's talk about paraphrasing paraphrasing the case notes. So we really are talking about writing today. Um, but just um, to let you know, we're on um, Facebook and we're on YouTube and our website is oetonline.net.au. That's where you can find us. Um, and remember, if you want to um, check out our course options, come and do a free trial course at oetonline.net.au, you can find all about what we offer with great range of um, daily live classes, practice tests, um, expert teachers, everything you need to clear OET. So do check that out. Okay, I'm just reloading. See if I'm gonna be on Facebook yet, it appears not. Okay. Um, that's OET Center Facebook page. Okay, keep going. So paraphrasing everyone, let's talk about it. What is paraphrasing? Well, this image is a really good image, everyone. I like this image. Uh, so let's just talk about this one. Um, we've got lots of great words here. So what is to paraphrase? What does it mean? Well, to paraphrase is to rewrite rewrite information um, or to restate, rephrase, rescript, reword, put things in your own words, add your voice. That's what paraphrasing is. Uh, while you're paraphrasing, you're going to use clauses. You're going to expand on the case notes and create dependent and independent clauses. You're going to add your own phrases or you're going to rephrase, perhaps you're going to rephrase in patient friendly language, perhaps you're going to rephrase into professional language. So lots of things you need to do. As Sagitha says, yes, restate these words. Uh, you're going to use, you're going to use synonyms um, when you might have a, you're going to use synonyms to get the um, right word um, for what you want to uh, express, uh, but you also may use antonyms to, to say the same thing using opposites. So synonyms and antonyms are used in paraphrasing. And then you're going to summarize um, to reduce the word length. That is an aspect of paraphrasing. And then finally, I mean, very importantly, pardon me, you need to interpret you need to interpret the case note. So information is given to you and you need to connect different ideas and interpret as a health professional. So that's about meaning. So all of these things um, uh, sort of describe what paraphrasing is. Um, a lot involved. It is a um, legitimate academic skill that you need when looking information at information is given oh, to you. Here we go. And you need to connect different ideas and interpret as a health profession. It's like something's just come live. Sorry for that echo, everyone. I'm just going to turn that down. Pardon me again. 
suddenly that volume appeared. See if I can turn it down, everyone. Can you hear me right now? Just type in a yes if you can hear me. I've just got to get uh, rid of a volume there. Can everyone hear me loud and clear, everyone? Just type in yes if you can. Yes, great. Okay, good. I've just had to adjust some volume. Uh, Moda says, which place are you? Yes, in Brisbane. All right. Okay, let's continue, everyone. Okay. So I've got a, a whole bunch of steps, everyone, a whole bunch of steps here uh, that we're going to go through. The eight essential steps of successful paraphrasing. So let's look at them, everyone. Let's have a look at what those steps are. So, number one, expand. So you need to expand on the case notes. It's one of the oh, it's one of the instructions written on the writing task. Expand on the case notes. So you need to ask yourself, which words do you need to add? to make a complete sentence. Articles, prepositions, and verbs are generally omitted uh, from the case notes, but you need to input them into your letter. So rule number one, make sure you expand. Number two, keep. Which words are essential and should not be changed? There are keepers, everyone, words which you're gonna use in your letter, you're going to borrow them. Names of procedures, medical conditions, symptoms that the patient is experiencing. Remember, case notes are notes taken about that patient at that time. So they're accurate. So a lot of the vocabulary in the case notes um, you're going to keep and put into your letter. So you don't need to use synonyms for everything. Keep the relevant words um, you just need to manipulate them so that they are grammatically correct in your letter so there are keepers everyone then modify because you're transforming notes into grammatically correct sentences you're going to need to change words to ensure they fit grammatically verbs may change from active to passive form that will enable you to focus on the relevant aspects of the case notes. You might um, turn adjectives into nouns or nouns into adjectives to create the correct um, degree of formality and refer to my prep hour on nominalization for more details on that, everyone. Um, you're going to use synonyms. Uh, is there a way to express the condition or symptoms medically? Perhaps you can use an umbrella term. Um, so using synonyms is a good thing, but you don't have to do it for everything. But yes, use synonyms and as we'll see today, antonyms as well. Um, omit. When you're paraphrasing, there's a lot of non-relevant in information in the case notes. So you need to ask yourself which Details are not relevant. So omission, that is part of paraphrasing. Then rearrange. You don't have to write in the same order as the case notes. In fact, it's very desirable not to follow the exact order of the case notes. You're going to rearrange, rearrange words, rearrange information so that your letter provides an overview of the case. That will ensure that information flows smoothly and the reader gets to identify the most important information first and lesser, uh, less important information further down. Rearrange. Uh, combine. Um, you've got a lot of facts in your case notes um, that can be combined and you're going to combine them into compound and complex sentences and you're going to join these sentences with conjunctions 
Um, so uh, whether it be a coordinating conjunction, as in a compound structure, or a subordinating conjunction when you're writing a complex sentence. Um, combine the facts. Finally, recheck. Very importantly, once you've paraphrased, you need to recheck and ask yourself, does your sentence match the meaning of the case notes? If it doesn't, there's a problem. It's very important when you paraphrase that you make the meaning match. Otherwise, you may be giving false information about the patient and then you're going to lose marks um, for content and in other aspects of the criteria. Okay, so I've just told you the eight essential steps, everyone. Before we go any further, um, type in any texts or any questions that you may have before we start doing this. Astro has typed in, um, do we need to expand the case notes which are relevant or we need to write the central idea of the whole cue card, I guess you mean the case notes. Um, I would say both. You need to, there'll be some aspects of the case notes, Astral, that are essential, you know, so, you know, like the discharge plan, for example, you might want to include all that information, the core, the most important information may be expanding. But now then there's going to be other aspects that is, um, it's less important. So you're going to do more of that central idea, more that summary type. Does that answer your question? Um, I'm just checking for a few other questions here. Um, Somi says about complex sentences while writing patients' history. Well, patients, your patients' histories are complex. There's aspects of complexity in the history. So you will need to use complex sentences when writing. Alrighty. Tina says, can we combine the condition and discharge plans together to make a better paragraph? Yes, Tina, it's possible. It is possible to talk, um, do a subject-based approach. So you don't have to have just the discharge paragraph at the end. Important aspects of the discharge could be written in earlier paragraphs if you're doing a subject-based approach. Discharge aspects related to mobility could be in one paragraph about when you're talking about the patient's mobility. There might be, you might have another paragraph which focuses on the medication and the discharge details could be there. So there are several ways you can do things. There's not just a one way. Other questions coming through. Uh, can we write letters in a chronological way? Absolutely. And for example, a discharge, chronolog chronology is excellent. Patients condition that admission, then their progression, then their discharge requirements. Also, other cases, you might, it could be a consultation, but there was only one visit and it may not be urgent. So you may choose to put all the background information first, then followed by the, the current information. That's chronology. It works. Uh, keep going. Methodist says, can you please give an overview of coordinating conjunction subordinating? Probably not today, Methodist or Methodist Church there in Dhaka, but your coordinating conjunctions are fanboys and the subordinating, well, there's so many subordinating conjunctions, but that's just the sort of thing that we cover in our live classes. So check out our website there, Methodist. Um, okay. All right, I think I'm gonna move on because we're gonna cover some of these things in our session, but lovely to see all your questions, everyone. Um, Anita says, can you explain about yours sincerely and yours faithfully? Well, they're both fairly acceptable. Um, I'm a, a fan of yours sincerely, um, but yours faithfully is used particularly if you don't know the name of the person who you're writing to, maybe just say tight. Uh, the OET Centre website has a document on that one you can visit. Sarah says, can we use a veterinary medicine writing sample? Well, if you're a vet, Sarah, 
that's what you should be using. All right, now lots of questions coming through. I'm going to jump straight into paraphrasing everyone. So I hope I got to answer your questions. Let's go into a bit more detail. So let's begin everyone and you're going to get involved in this. Um, so look at this page, everyone. I'm just going to check the OET Center Facebook feed. Um, see if I am on OET Center Facebook. I wasn't the last time I looked, but maybe I am now. Just a second, everybody. Still not there yet. Just a sec, everyone. Apologies for this delay. Technology is fun, isn't it? See if I can get on the right page. See if we are broadcasting on their Facebook. Yes, we are wonderful. So hello to OET Center Facebook. I've got you there as well. I'll just say hello. Hello from Steve. All right, now I can answer your questions there as well. Okay, I'm gonna move on everyone. I'm glad we, that's all sorted. So everyone's here, wonderful. Okay, now, so as I said before, we're looking at all of these steps. So the first one, expand everyone. Won't do these in exact order. Which words do you need to add to make a complete sentence? So look at this one, this is allergies everyone. We can see from this image, this person has quite a few allergies. So Mrs. Cope, nil allergies. So an incorrect sentence, Mrs. Cope has nil allergies. So can we correct that sentence, everyone? Have a go. Um, nil is not good here because it's Latin, not English. So that's an example of um, incorrect paraphrasing. AJ's had a go. Mrs. Cope has no history of allergies. Excellent, AJ. Uh, let's see what else we get. Um, uh, Sarah wants to, just a side topic. Sarah wants to discuss a veterinary writing sample here. Coming up, Sarah. We'll do one of those this year. So other ones, Mrs. Cope has no allergies. And I've got Mrs. Cope has no known allergies. Ahmed writes, Mrs. has no allergy to allergy. <laughs> that's a new one. Not sure if that's quite what we're looking for. Um, no history of allergy. Probably I would use plural allergies, everyone. Well done, Sigitha. Um, and lots of good sentences coming through. So that's pretty straightforward. Well done. Mrs. Cope is not allergic, Sour writes, not really right. Um, what the most common, the formal way, no, no, and allergies. Next one, allergies, Mr. Z, codeine, dust mite, sulfur dioxide. Let's try the second one. And this one I've got, Mr. Z is allergic to codeine, dust mites, and sulfur dioxide. But what I'm gonna show you here, Mr. Z is allergic to codeine and sulfur. So why have I omitted dust mites? Well, dust mites is the odd one out. So that's just about being selective. Perhaps we're talking more about the, um, the things related to um, medication or uh, drugs or those sorts of things. So we can just note dust mites may not be relevant. So remember, you can omit should you choose to. Joshua says, is it necessary to write if no allergies? Well, I'd probably ask the audience to answer Joshua's question, but case by case, 
Sometimes depends who you're writing to. You're writing to a doctor, they may want to know that. You're writing to a physiotherapist or an occupational therapist, it may not be relevant to them. So the, the answer to your question, Joshua, is, is it relevant to your reader? If it is, include it. If not, leave it out. And you must use your judgment. So the whole thing about um, a lot of the questions coming through, there's not one answer. It's about using your professional judgment. You need to make decisions. Okay, I'm moving on everyone. Uh, I won't, apologies if I can't get to all the comments. I'm gonna select certain comments, um, but I will not be able to answer all because we have quite a big audience. Okay, now we're gonna look at um, smoking and alcohol. So the social history. So this is the omit section, everyone. Which details are not relevant? Extra, now, now, make a note of this. Extra information slows the reader down. Your reader is a busy health professional. They don't want to be slowed down. They want the relevant facts. And the sooner they get them, the better. So if you're giving non-relevant information, that distracts from the main idea. It slows the reader down. It makes it harder to find the key point. Okay, so look at this one, Mary Roden. We've got a date of birth, 1972. How old is this patient, everyone, based on today's date, if she's born in 72? She's a teacher, um, secondary history in English. She's divorced, two children. We've got birth dates. She's a non-smoker since children born. Uh, she drinks occasionally with friends, mainly wine. So we got... We need to rephrase this, everyone. I'll give you an example of what's not good. And perhaps, everyone, you can type in which things you think may be less relevant here. Because uh, it's not all relevant. Remember, we want to put a bit of background to explain who this patient is. OK. And remember, it's case by case here. So someone saying she's 42, maybe not, but 48. Uh, could be correct, I believe. Let's check. Mrs. Roden is a divorced English and history teacher at a secondary school who has two children aged 15 and 13, respectively. She stopped smoking when her children were born and enjoys drinking wine with her friends. Okay, so there's a lot of non-relevant information there. Do we really want to tell the reader that she's divorced? That's a little bit judgmental. Okay. Um, children may be irrelevant, but again, Diksha, I would say depends on who you're writing to. Um, that'll help you decide who it's relevant for. Um, so if you're writing to a social worker, perhaps you do want to mention, you know, um, that she has children. Um, Non-smoke is also relevant. Again, it depends. It's not black and white, case by case. Let's have a look. Let's fill some gaps, everyone. So I think, let's say we're, we're painting a picture here. Miss Roden is a 48-year-old teacher, always good to mention the profession, but we don't need to say what she teaches. Um, with, now I've got a, a challenge for you. How can we express the children? Can we come up with a synonym here? I don't want to say the children's birth date, but how could we express that if we decided to mention the children, how could we express it? This is a paraphrasing exercise. Now I can see a lot of people aren't good with math. A lot of people are saying 38. So you do need to get the age of the patient right. So do your math. Um, it's 28 and we're in 2020, not 2010. So I'd say she's 48. Bilal says, Bilal says two kids, but Kids is informal. Let's have a look. Young children, nice try, AJ, but fit at 15 and 13, young is often to um, perhaps under 10. School age children, now you're getting their dictionary. And I've got this to teenage children. All right, so we can be specific with our language. That's a good synonym. 
Um, she stopped smoking. Now, it says since children are born. So give me a year. Oh, how long ago did she stop smoking? How long ago? How long ago? <laughs> Sanya says our course is very expensive. Well, um, probably not, Sanya, but I, I get it. Depends where you're located. I actually think they're really good value and we've really dropped our prices. So the exam costs a lot of money. Big dreams. Anyway, we've got this free service for you. So hopefully that helps you. Um, now I've got she stopped smoking 15 years ago. 15 years ago. So that's just another way to express it. So try that on exam day, everyone. Look for different ways to express the information. That's what paraphrasing is. Um, and look, drinks occasionally with friends. We don't really, not so interested in what she drinks. We can say she's a social drinker. So that's paraphrasing everyone. Lots of original terms. And that's what you've got to try to do. Okay, I'm going to keep moving on. Now let's look at this one, everyone. Let's look at um, omission here. Which details are not relevant? Uh, which facts can be combined to create compound and complex sentences? So we're going to use some conjunction, conjunctions here. So we've got a situation. You are a health professional in a community health center. A patient you've been monitoring is moving to another city to live with his daughter. Okay, that's what we know. Mr. Edmund, he's got diabetes. Uh, he's, there's, there's a GP prescribed metformin. He's non-compliant. He resents having to take medication. And he's got a reason, always been healthy. He appears unmotivated, takes medication intermittently and double doses sometimes. There's a few problems with his medication. Let's have a look. So here's a poor summary. Mr. Edmonds was prescribed metformin by his GP for type 2 diabetes. He said he does not need to take the medication because he's healthy. He seems to be unmotivated and takes his medication intermittently and sometimes takes double the dose. A few typos there as well. 42 words, and it's really including too much information. How are we going to paraphrase that? Now I'll show you, and um, we need some joining words, everyone. Now, while we're waiting for that, Jismi says, can we write the words drinker? Is it not judgmental? No, it's factual. Smoker, drinker. You're not, if you wanted to be judgmental, you might say a heavy drinker when you can't back that up with numbers, um, but simply saying someone is a, a type of drinker, a social drinker, is not judgmental. Okay. Um, but be cautious with your language. Um, if someone drinks regularly, Unisha says, if someone drinks regularly, can we say she's a heavy drinker? No, you can't. Just because you drink regularly doesn't mean you're a heavy drinker. Different meaning. Okay. Um, let's do some joining words here. Mr. Edmund takes metformin for his type 2 diabetes. Now we need a contrast word here, everyone. Thank you, Sabatni. However, he has not been compliant with his medication. There's our um, coordinate, there's our conjunction. Um, however, he has not been compliant with his medication, something he has a history of intermittent use. So we're going to use and. So let's read that. However, he has not been compliant with his medication, comma, and has a history of intermittent use, intermittent use of medication, and occasional double doses. Uh, some people are writing moreover, probably avoid moreover, but here we're just going to use and. So that joins our, we've got a comma, that's our 
fanboys conjunction. Someone asked about conjunctions before. That's a fanboys conjunction for compound sentences. We've got a comma here to make it clear. Uh, and there it is, everyone. And look at the words, 28 words, paraphrasing. That's what you need to do, everyone. That's what you need to do. All right, lots of good comments coming in there. Thank you, everyone, for your comments. Um, let's continue. Okay, we're going to rearrange this time. We're going to rearrange everybody. Um, Marjan says, should we always put a comma after however? I think it's a good idea, Marjan. It's a good... Um, it's good, correct punctuation. Um, Adam says, could you talk more about organization of paragraphs? Not today, Adam. Today's not about that. Today's about paraphrasing. Um, but we will be doing, last week, I, we did a complete doctor's task where we looked at organization. So check out the most recent prep hour there, Adam. And Ada Ahmad says, can I use nonetheless, nevertheless? Nonetheless and nevertheless sound like sort of IELTS or PTE type exam language, not really commonly used in medical writing. I, too emphatic, I believe. Okay. Uh, Medicine King says, can you explain fanboys? Uh, I would say, Join our classes, Medicine King, and you'll get all the details, or you can also Google those things. But now we're talking about paraphrasing. Okay, you are a health professional at the Underhill Clinic, a new patient, everyone, a new patient. Miss Melanie Wright consults you about pain in her knee. So let's have a look. She's got pain in her left knee. So we've got today's day, presenting problem, intermittent medial left knee pain. It's got a pain score, a VAS score, three out of 10. Some swelling, intermittent tightness, left posterior thigh, occasional lower back pain, not related. Current background, two weeks ago, patient turned suddenly while walking and felt something pop in her, um, that should be in her posterior thigh. Um, and then we've got something noted here, increased gym exercise for three weeks prior. Now we've got an interesting timeline there, everyone. Let's look at our timeline. And we've got some text there as well. So let's look what happened first. It's all started, we've got today's date, but if we look at it closely, and this is what you always need to work out, it says here the pain started two weeks ago. So this is today's date where she's got the intermittent um, pain. Then two weeks prior, two weeks before, two weeks ago, this is when it happened, the incident occurred. Patient turned suddenly while walking. So that happened here. And then before that, increased gym exercises three weeks prior. So we go all the way back to the 19th of August. So this is your job, everyone. This is your job. You've got to work out the timeline. In the OET exam, you've got to do some math, everyone. You've got to work out the order of events because that's going to affect your verb tense and your signal markers. So let's look at how we write this, everyone. I'm going to fill the gaps in here. Mrs. Wright presented, and we've got gray there, we've got a date. So let's, rather than use the date, let's use today. Mrs. Wright presented today, complaining of, and then we've got two weeks ago. So for two weeks ago, we're gonna use complaining of a two week history. Nice formal expression. Complaining of a two week history. So we're paraphrasing everyone a two week history of intermittent medial left knee pain. And we've got three out of 10, that's relevant. We don't have to say mild or moderate. Uh, this is actually a physiotherapy task. 
So putting that numerical value is useful when writing to a, another physiotherapist. Okay, so she's got the pain with concomitant swelling and intermittent tightness of the left posterior thigh expanding. The symptoms, now again, we're coming back to this date. The symptoms first occurred when she turned suddenly while walking. So look at that first occurred, the start point. It's a good way to get that timeline that we're talking about here. First occurred when she turned suddenly while walking. Continue. For three weeks prior to, now we've got that, what happened? For three weeks prior to the onset. Now that's the onset of the symptoms. For three weeks prior to the onset, she, now here's your chance everyone. What word goes here? We've got the arrow up, there it is. And we've got this space. Now this is a, a trick, everyone. We want to use a verb tense that reflects this time period. What do we use here? 23rd, that's today. Well done, Muhammad, straight off. We're gonna use our past perfect, everyone. Um, she had increased her exercise. So Ty's written has increased, no. If we wanted to use has increased, we'd be talking about this time period, right? So I can type in here, this is our past perfect, perfect always for a period of time. But over here is our present perfect. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Um, that's going to tell you um, which verb tense to use. Okay. So challenging, isn't it? But lots of paraphrasing there, everyone. Lots of, um, a lot of care. And this is what you need to do with the case notes. You need to really build that skill. Practice is the key. It's challenging to... Um, put that order in a, a, a clear uh, way. That is your challenge. Take your time. Practice those skills. Um, you need good grammatical awareness. Um, and you really need to um, just build those skills, everyone. Okay. Let's continue. Synonyms, everyone. Synonyms, everyone. So can anyone tell me what's happening in that image there? What's happening in that image? And while I'm waiting for that answer, uh, I'm just going to check some comments. was one comment I saw. Uh, Mohammed says, what sentence length is acceptable when paraphrasing? Um, it's case by case, Mohammed. It's like saying, how long is a piece of string? Well, it depends on the string. So can't add, that just depends. Okay. All right, yeah, now it's a bit small. Tussa got it, it's root canal treatment. Yes, up in the corner there. Um, and Muda says, we'll commonly use sentences affect the mark. Not if they're correct, um, Muda, but yes, a variety of structures, professional language is what you're aiming for. Uh, you might not see me because of that. My image is there. Thank you, Adnan. Well, it's root canal treatment, everyone. So let's have a look. So your patient, Miss Joyce Williams, needs endodontic treatment to complete root canal therapy on one of her teeth. So Mrs. Williams. So we've got a date. So look, 2nd of the 4th, 2019. So that's like a long time ago. Let's imagine that's like, um, yeah, that's a long time ago. Um, she had a uh, 237, had a distal occlusal tunnel. Uh, it was very deep. 60% possibility of root canal therapy. This is 
dental jargon, everyone. She came back um, nearly, you know, a year later or six months later or quite a lot later, nearly a year. And she had, uh, I think that's a distal buckle. I'm not a dentist, but any dentist here may like to get involved. Still an issue was 37. Um, and IRM means she had a restoration and, and she needs root canal treatment. But then it says the patient was concerned about the cost, which is to delay the treatment. Came back a um, couple of weeks later, pain has come back. And now the RCT is rescheduled because she's in pain. She now wants the RCT. Then six days later, she canceled it because she said the pain's gone away. So this patient must have a big fear of um, root canal treatment because it's on again, off again. Please dentist, do it now, don't. Um, it's too expensive or no, I don't. Yes, please do it, it's painful. Then the pain goes, okay, I don't want it now. It happens, it happens. Any dentists in the audience today could probably verify that this happens. Let's look at how we're going to express this, everyone, and you can help me. So um, Mrs. Williams was, and I've got first advice, and this is the beginning, that she might require. So what we're doing here, everyone, I think you can see it. It says here 60% possibility, might. So we're using words to summarize numerals. That's paraphrasing. Continue. Mrs. Williams was first advised that she might require RCT of Route 37 12 months ago. Let's imagine roughly 12 months ago after a distal occlusal tunnel restoration. She was initially. Now give me a synonym, everyone. Give me a synonym wish to delay RCT. So delay, can, what's the synonym? What word can we use for the patient that wants to delay treatment? We need an adjective, everyone. Let's describe her. She didn't want the treatment. That means she was what? What was she? Well, the appointment was postponed data. Unwilling, yes. Well done, Shadin. And I've got hesitant, excellent, AJ and Marjan, reluctant. She was initially reluctant to undergo RCT due to, okay, let's try another one, everyone. Patient concerned about cost. Due to what? As Mina says, procrastinate. Yes, but that's a bit judgmental, as Mita. So we wouldn't want to say the patient was procrastinating. Um, she was concerned about the cost. Can you think of a word to express that? Financial issues, thank you. Maksuda, yes. And Marjan, yes, financial concerns, that's right. Jude, these are all great words. And I've got a different one, financial constraints. Something that was tightening in, she was constrained. So there's our synonyms, everyone. Um, you've got to be careful, not expenses so much, but concerns or issues, um, high cost, but that's not formal enough there. Hossam, Sabatni writes expensiveness. I don't think that's a word. Um, okay. But she agreed to proceed once the tooth became, give me a sentence, or pain, this is an easy one. Pain, painful, just the adjective became painful on this date. Uh, the appointment was, subsequently, I'll put that word in for you, the appointment was subsequently cancelled when the tooth became, okay, patient reports pain gone away. So give me a synonym for pain gone away. Give me a, a proper medical word, everyone. Pain-free, um, yes, but I, I want painless is good. When the tooth pain subsided, possibly. Something else, keep trying, everyone. 
and um, a real medical word, a technical word, because it's, yes, Rena got it. Well done, Rena. Asymptomatic. This we're writing from professional to professional. So you do want to use this type of language, everyone. Professional to professional. Okay, so we didn't want, and in inverted commas, that's what the patient said. You don't want to use their word. Um, so we can use a technical word because you're a professional writing to another professional. There you have it, everyone. Really good use of synonyms. Okay. Continue. We'll do another one. Now, this one uh, is a little bit different, everyone. Uh, question, is there a way to express the technical terms in patient-friendly language? So this one is a letter to a patient about medication. The typical kind of letter a pharmacist would write. Type in yes if, if you're a pharmacist watching this. Pharmacists often have to write to patients explaining um, details about their medication. And we don't want to use too much technical jargon in these cases. So we've got Panadine Fort, and we've got a lot of information there. I'll sort of go through this together. So here's our paragraph. Panadine Fort has been prescribed for pain relief and should be taken. So we've got this word, Panadine Fort, 500 mg, max for hourly PRN. Okay, here's my first challenge for you. Um, PRN, everyone, give me a synonym for PRN. Your patient won't know PRN. How will you express PRN? It should be taken P cautiously. Nice try, Max Huda. Regularly, I don't think so. Yeah, as needed. When required, now we're getting it, or well, as required, as necessary. These are all correct. Yep, it's a standard medical one. And then it says, but max for hourly. That's a bit harder. But max for hourly. That's note form. You've got to expand. You've got to expand. But max for hourly. That's a hard one, everyone. Um, I should write as per required. No, we don't need the per as required. Okay. And remember with these ones, Astral says no time zone given. Just remember, we're just using in general here. Uh, so we, we don't have the full case notes. So um, don't worry too much about time zones for these little mini versions. Sarah, it's not exceeding four, not more than four hourly. That's pretty good, Marjan. Um, I've got here, not more than every four hours. That's a hard one to express. A maximum of six times a day. Nice. Good synonym. Maximum of six doses. Well done. This medication now, it can cause constipation. Patients know constipation. We can use that language. Nausea, we can use, but we've got nausea. But what's a softer word, abdominal cramps? Patients probably would know abdominal cramps, but you might choose to use a more common um, lay term here, abdominal cramps. Abdominal pain, you're getting their vena, right? Tummy pain. Good, but almost gone too far using tummy. Um, I'd probably go stomach pain, colic. But remember, Ahmad, we're writing to the patient. So um, I think tummy is a little bit too soft, almost if you were talking to a child. Um, I've got here stomach aches. Yeah, it can cause stomach aches. And a lot of people wrote that. Abdominal discomfort is good, Farouk. Um, that, that's a good expression. And Scarlet, well done. Okay. Um, to counteract these symptoms, 
Maxilon can be taken up to, what's TDS, everyone? TDS. TDS, everyone. Thrice a day, but we can't really use thrice data because that's um, a little bit old fashioned, three times a day. So all you people using thrice, avoid that in the exam. A um, little bit old fashioned, three times a day is the standard. Um, and you can use the numeral like I have, it's clear, or you can use it, write it in full. Um, please note, although rare, both medications can cause, so we've got here, so this is the codeine and the uh, metoclopramide. Um, it says impaired alertness, it's written twice. Can you give me a synonym for impaired alertness? That's a tricky one, impaired alertness. You're getting tired, not anxiety. No, alertness is not about anxiety. Dizziness, no, it's not about dizziness. That's not what alertness means. Lethargy, yes, we're getting close there, Marjan. Altered alertness. <laughs> but lethargy is more like tiredness. So, but impaired is a bit more mental. This um, in alert is more about your um, mental state, not your physical state. Sleepy, you're getting close. Methodist, well done. Drowsiness, everyone, drowsiness. That's the word. So build up that vocabulary. Not really co confusion, um, not necessarily quite accurate there. Um, some good words coming in, but you, you remember we're writing to a patient here, everyone. So we want to use less formal, so drowsiness was our word. And look at that, everyone. Just like that, time's gone up. And we've only looked at a few cases, everyone. We've only looked at a few cases. So I'm going to skip that one, everyone. I'll save that for another one. Wow. Paraphrasing. It's a lot of work. Now, if you find this sort of stuff interesting, if you like doing this sort of work, this is exactly what we do in our classes, everyone. We've got classes Monday to Friday, two times a day, AM and PM, suits all regions. So if you want to get into more of this sort of stuff to build your skills, this is exactly what we're doing in our live classes. And the more you do it, the better you get. Um, build those skills. Um, that's how it works. And clearly, it's challenging to write medical referral letters at that professional level. So hard work, focus, eight hours a day study, whatever your timeline is, just have a planned approach and build those skills step by step. And if you do want uh, um, a school to help you, come to OET online. Um, Methodist says, where to watch these classes? Um, you've got to enroll in a course there, Methodist. Um, if you enroll in a course, then you'll receive these live classes, everyone. And really affordable, everyone. Um, things, these are all in Australian dollars, not US dollars. So look at our courses, everyone. Starts with the economy. Just Australian, $99. It's all it costs. You're going to get two month access and you're going to get unlimited live classes. Wow. Think about that. That's a lot. Turbo, a little bit more. You get your two month access and you get three writing corrections to get you on track. Really nice. Moving up, we've got our standard. You're getting more content here. Six corrections, a private speaking class, lots of reading, listening material. Four-month access, um, $2.99. Keep going up, platinum. Six-month access, more, nine correction. Two speaking classes, lots of reading and listening. 
just Australian 439. Can't go wrong. Our ultimate, very popular course for those people who, if it fits your financial situation, um, unlimited access, the 12 months, full range, 12 corrections. So you decide what's best for you, but we have done our best to make our courses affordable. Just go to oetonline.net.au, everyone. I'll just drop that website in case you need it. Remember, we've got our free trial course, everyone. Uh, I'll tell you all where that is in case you don't know. Uh, let's just bring that up, everyone. Last thing to wrap this up. This is us, everyone, OET Online. Uh, you want to see what it's all about, check out our free trial course. You can even do a trial class here on Zoom. All our classes are on Zoom, everyone. So check out our free trial course. Um, and then if you like what you see and it fits your range, um, come and join us online, everyone. Come and join us online. All right, great audience today. Thank you all for coming. And um, we'll see you somewhere live and online. And uh, for those people who've got an exam coming up on uh, this Friday, 25th or Saturday 26th. I wish you good luck and see you next time. Bye for now.